I may not be in Monaco and I am slightly sad about that, but perhaps this is the next best thing. The Surrey Riviera. Perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, Red Bull showed very, very strongly in Thursday practice uh, for the Monaco Grand Prix. We thought they might come here uh, looking either favourites or certainly right at the front of the field, challenging the likes of Mercedes and Ferrari, and they absolutely did that. Not only did they challenge them, they absolutely blew them out of the water in Thursday practice. Now, I know that practice, whether it's Friday or Thursday at any Grand Prix, comes with a, a number of caveats about uh, different fuel loads, um, different run programs, uh, what the teams are looking at, what they're trying to assess, whether they're doing race runs, quali runs, aero runs, uh, you know, setup changes throughout the day. All of those things always apply and um, perhaps have even more of an impact uh, in Monaco. However, um, what I always do and what most people who analyse this sport do at the end of Friday or Thursday practice as it is in Monaco is we look at the, the, the tyre data or the lap time data across a number of runs and across a number of laps and try to find out what the average pace is or what the underlying pace is when you take out the anomalies of maybe the fastest lap or particularly slow laps because of traffic, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, you try and cross-reference the different types of tyre run with different, uh, different cars and different drivers. Uh, now, having done that uh, across the course of Thursday, um, Thursday practice, it really does highlight what an advantage Red Bull appear to have at this stage. Huge. What's really interesting, though, is that, um, and we're talking mostly, don't forget here, about the, the Hypersoft, the pink Hypersoft tyre, because Red Bull didn't bring anything else apart from one set of Ultrasofts and one set of Supersofts, which, of course, they will have to run one of, at least, uh, in the race on Sunday. So they won't be, won't be running on that tyre until Sunday. Um, some of the other teams tried different tyres. Uh, Mercedes um, tried both the Super Soft and the Ultra Soft. I think Lewis Hamilton's comment after trying the Super Soft uh, was very simply that he didn't feel safe on that tyre. Um, so I think it's safe to assume that they won't be using that tyre uh, in any sort of uh, competitive sense um, over the rest of the weekend. So that leaves us with the Ultra Soft and the Hyper Soft. The Hyper Soft so showed reasonably high degradation uh, on certain cars, the Mercedes being one of those. On the Red Bull, however, it didn't show anything like the levels of deg uh, that we were seeing with Lewis and Valtteri. Um, the other interesting thing was that the performance differential between the Ultra Soft tyre and the Hyper Soft tyre didn't seem to be that great. Uh, Valtteri Bottas, uh, and Lewis Hamilton did back-to-backs on their Mercedes on those two types of tyre and the difference between the two in terms of the average lap time over a race run was very very little, almost negligible. I guess the worrying thing for them was that that average lap time that was very similar between both of those two tyres on their car was still nowhere near the average lap time that the Red Bull was able to achieve on the Hypersoft. Given that Monaco is such a short lap, the shortest lap on the F1 calendar, uh, it's quite impressive by just how much Red Bull had an advantage. But really interestingly, uh, the first two sectors of this Monaco lap uh, were pretty close. In fact, sector one, I think the, the entire top six, the top three teams, were only covered by two tenths of a second. Um, the middle sector was equally very, very close between Daniel Ricciardo and uh, Lewis Hamilton and co. Um, but when it came to the final sector, which is a very short sector, only 19 seconds roughly covers that entire sector of the lap. So within 19 seconds, Daniel Ricciardo had managed to eke out two and a half tenths over everybody except his teammate. That is pretty unbelievable stuff. If you think about it, uh, the first two sectors of this Monte Carlo circuit, albeit within the realms of, of what is specific about the Monaco track itself, the first two sectors 
are you know our power sectors sector one has that uh, uphill flat out section up the hill out of Sandevot um, and then sector two has the tunnel which is another uh, reasonably flat out section and those areas are power dominated and drag affected as I say albeit relevant or, uh, or relative rather um, to the rest of the track if you compare them to other tracks around the, the, the F1 calendar the penalty for drag is very small and the benefit uh, for power is also very small but within this lap those are the two sectors perhaps that might not suit uh, the Red Bull with its power deficit and its high downforce and therefore uh, reasonably high drag setup. Sector 3 however is the bit where you come out of the swimming pool section uh, down towards Raskas through the last corner and onto that little bit of a start finish straight. Um, sector 3 ends kind of halfway along that start finish straight. Um, so actually no real power sectors or sections of that sector and that's really where Red Bull are absolutely crushing the competition. Um, the high rake and high downforce concept on that Red Bull, uh, Red Bull car really paying dividends where the drag penalty around here for the, the levels of downforce that they're running has almost no deficit or no penalty. Um, so they are really, really maximising that section of the lap and, and eking out a decent chunk of time over pretty much everybody else. And it's only the two Red Bulls that seem to be each other's competition uh, in terms of outright lap time. Now at many circuits where you have a tyre like the Hypersoft tyre that's quick for ultimate lap time but maybe at most tracks wouldn't be your optimum race tyre because of um, you know, its, its low level of durability or, or the length of time you might be able to last on in the race, you might look at trying to qualify on the next tyre up the range in Q2. Um, don't forget Q2 is where uh, your lap time or your best lap time determines which tyre you start the race on. So the optimum strategy at many circuits might be to start the race on a slightly harder tyre, assuming you can get through Q2 on that tyre, get into Q3, put on the soft tyre or the softest tyre and, uh, and get the best lap time you can to determine your grid position. Here in Monaco though, slightly different because overtaking is so difficult that strategy actually becomes less of an issue. And so actually what you really need is to make sure you get through Q Q2, obviously into Q3, but starting the race on the Hypersoft tyre is not such a penalty because pretty much everyone else is going to be doing the same. And if you were to lose track position at the start of the race, which is one of the few opportunities where overtaking or losing places uh, can occur when all the cars are bunched up at the start, of course, um, that's such a big issue uh, around here that you really need the best tyre to start the race. And that Hypersoft will be the one that will give you the best launch off the line and therefore the best opportunity not to be compromised uh, in that opening lap. Having said that, what you do need to be in Monaco is flexible when it comes to strategy. And uh, if you think about the last few years of this race, two of the last three I think have been won uh, because of kind of messed up uh, pit stops or messed up pit stop strategies. The other was, was won by a, a massive overcut. If you remember, Sebastian Vettel, I think, stayed out for an extra five laps over Lewis Hamilton and managed to eke out enough of a gap to come out in front of him. So whilst overtaking on track is very difficult, uh, perhaps through that pit stop phase, and we expect it to be a one-stop race pretty easily for most people, in fact for everybody, um, the one opportunity or the biggest opportunity is going to come through the pit stop phase uh, whether your team can deliver a, a, a brilliant pit stop under pressure and whether the strategists uh, can make sure that you don't you don't mess up. Uh, it's unlikely you're going to come up with a brilliant strategy that will win you the race but you could very easily lose the race on the strategy here as well. safety car here is almost a hundred percent you know you can almost factor a safety car into your strategy uh, in Monaco one thing you can't do is factor when it's going to come in of course much higher chance at the beginning of the race um, but at some point we can be reasonably sure that a safety car or at least a virtual safety car will come and you need to be flexible enough with your strategy you're not going to get caught out having just made a pit stop and therefore lose out 
uh, to the rest of the field. That means we can't see too many teams taking big risks in terms of an early stop. Uh, the preferred strategy is likely to be to stay out as long as you can whilst maintaining track position, even if your lap times are suffering. Because no one can overtake you, if you're at the front of the field, you can afford to keep staying out, keep staying out, waiting to see if that safety car is going to come. Obviously, at some point, you've got to make the change, but you can do that based on what your competitors behind are doing. If the guys behind you look like they are faster, you want to stay out as long as you can. If they are suffering on their tyres and starting to slow down, you know that you've perhaps got a little bit of a safety window behind to make your stop when you want, knowing that they can't overcut you and do some faster lap times. So you've got to be flexible, um, but absolutely track position is everything around Monaco. Absolutely everything. We have caught, traditionally, of course, we see uh, the Red Bulls not necessarily being able to maintain their Friday or practice pace through to Saturday in qualifying. And a large part of that is because they don't have the ability that uh, the Mercedes and the Ferrari have to turn the power unit up to, uh, to absolute maximum for qualifying, party mode, as Lewis once described it. Um, they don't have that ability with the Renault power unit uh, to the same extent that the others have. However, the advantage of that power unit setting around Monaco is obviously very much diminished with it not being a power circuit. Uh, so any advantage that Mercedes or Ferrari might have had at a regular racetrack will be very, you know, almost negligible, I would have said, in terms of what they can deliver from the power unit around here, particularly given that the Red Bull is so much faster in that final sector. Outside of Red Bull, it actually looks like Ferrari might have the upper hand over Mercedes even, but although, albeit just a tiny, tiny amount. But I think back to last year, Mercedes struggled. And lots of people have pointed the, the, the finger at the fact they've got a, a longer wheelbase car, uh, which might not suit the slower, tighter, twisty turns of Monaco. And that's absolutely true, but I do think that the disadvantage that that uh, long wheelbase gives is kind of minuscule. The fact they've got a long wheelbase car also uh, gives them the ability to generate more downforce from that, uh, the longer aero surfaces that they have. So I think the deficit is negligible um, and I don't really think that's the reason behind them struggling this weekend. It's much more to do with the way their car handles the tyres. The left front is graining so much so that you can really clearly see it on the TV pictures as it goes around the lap. The Red Bull is definitely not suffering to anywhere near the same extent and that to some extent at least, has something to do with the way that uh, the Red Bull looks much more comfortable in race pace than the Mercedes does. Thursday was the first time in the entire hybrid era that Red Bull have had a 1-2 on uh, both practice sessions on the same weekend. Can they turn that into pole position or even a front row lockout and then Translate that into a race win. All the data suggests that they can.